So yes, I'm Liz Kell. Um, I'm the course lead for the PWP training at UCLan, but um, I'm one of the old primary care graduate mental health workers that Elizabeth mentioned this morning. Um, so step two is very much what I'm about, and I'm the chair of the Northwest PWP Professional Network. So um, as hopefully you're all aware, in February of this year, the Charter for Psychological Staff Wellbeing and Resilience was launched by the BPS um, at the New Savoy Conference, and that's supported by Public Health England. And the Charter calls for a greater focus on support for staff wellbeing in psychological services. That Charter was developed in part to two recent surveys of wellbeing among psychological professionals, which asked for participants' views on stress, mood and wellbeing, as well as an impact on work. And the findings of the most recent survey did indicate increasingly reporting feelings of failure and depression, as well as a relentless focus on targets, particularly within IAP services. So following the charter launch, um, a learning collaborative has been developed to share ideas in how to implement improved staff wellbeing in services. And one of the agreed Pathfinder projects within this to further investigate the wellbeing of the PWP workforce specifically, to understand any particular elements unique to that new workforce, which is essential really to the success of IAP services. The PWP role is very different to a lot of more traditional therapy roles in terms of the number of people seen in a working day and the challenges of working briefly with people who often have very complex lives. Given that, it's really important that we consider if the issues for the workforce are also different, which is why we very much wanted to do the survey again, particularly just with the PWPs. So for example, unlike most therapy training, there is very little attention to practitioner wellbeing in the PWP curriculum. There's almost an implied assumption that emotional content doesn't affect you when you're working briefly with people. But really, is that true, particularly given the breadth and volume of emotional content that a PWP works with, often with very little space in between patients? Um, so the, this survey was carried out across the north of England, um, and it was completed by 173 PWPs, and there was a fairly equal split between North West, North East and Yorkshire and Humber in those responses. And similar to the national um, survey, the questions were in relation to the three main domains of personal well-being, social well-being and well-being at work. Um, and the third section used the work-related quality of life scale, which has been used quite widely across a number of different sectors, including the NHS. Um, they were mainly closed questions with additional comments separately um, at the end and then also attached to a small number of other questions. Um, I'm just going to add that I've not had these results for very long, so this is a bit of a quick and dirty analysis, but hopefully you're all going to be interested in the results as I was. So I think we probably already know this, but these figures just really highlighted to me what the PWP workforce is. So 81% female. 60% aged 16 to 34, actually only 17% of the workforce were aged over 45. Obviously some of these statistics are a little bit less about well-being, but it does really highlight some of the challenges for the workforce in being more representative of the populations that we're working with. Um, so I still wanted to share that. And I think it's also relevant in terms of perhaps some of the skills and abilities in terms of particular ages and other groups. So in terms of personal well-being, um, the depression results were quite similar to the national survey and the feelings of failure were slightly lower than the national survey, which is really positive. But there are some really worrying numbers here, particularly given that this is a really young workforce of people who are at very early stages of their career who realistically are going to be working until they're at least 70. So, <laughs> um, and in terms of the depression questions, we did include a comment section with that and nearly half of those responses were in relation to work, so I just wanted to share a couple of those. So at work, the pressures are so high and the management so poor that I feel dehumanised and a dispensable part of a machine. All managers seem to care about is have you got the right number of clients, are they meeting caseness, targets are relentless. So quite depressing <laughs> comments. Um, again, similar to the national survey, the social wellbeing section had the most positive results in it. Um, so PWPs do appear to have good support around them, and we know that that's really important for people's personal emotional well-being. So the work section. Started with some positives. So only 5% of PWPs said that they rarely find the job interesting. No one said they never found it interesting, so that's really good to hear. Um, but it's not all good because there's still 8% who often or always felt bullied and 10% who often observed bullying. 
although obviously 82% saying that they'd never felt subjected to personal harassment through bullying is really positive. Um, again, the figures are similar to the national survey in relation to bullying and discrimination. Um, but I do think it's interesting that although it's only a small figure in terms of the 15% who did experience discrimination, 40% of those reported that it was in relation to age, and that was from patients or relatives. Um, so, sadly, there were some less positives. Two-thirds of respondents often found the job stressful. 50% were rarely or never satisfied with the amount of time they spent on administration. Only one person was satisfied with the amount of time they do spend on admin, one of 173. Only five people were satisfied with the amount of time they spent on performance. So again, 50% rarely or never satisfied with the amount of time they spent meeting performance targets. Nearly three quarters feeling pressured into meeting targets. Um, only 50% were always or often satisfied with the amount of time they have for supervision, which does suggest that there is some really good practice out there in terms of supervision, but also some problems. And only 20% were satisfied with the amount of time spent on CPD, which has been a consistent theme raised by PWPs over recent years. Mm, we're not moving on. It's falling out with me. Oh, there we go. So... Only 19% of people said that they didn't have clear goals and aims, which is great, although there were 31% who gave a neutral response to that question. Um, Two-thirds have the opportunities to use their abilities, which is really positive, but less than half of them felt that doing a good job was acknowledged by their manager. Only a third felt encouraged to develop new skills, which, as we know, there's real issues around PWP retention. It does raise the question as to whether that's part of the problem. And only 40% were satisfied with training that they received to do the job. It's not clear if that's in relation to the initial training they receive as a PWP or ongoing training. So it will be really useful to understand that more. But as you'll see later, there are some other comments in relation to that that do suggest it is more about ongoing training. Personally, I was most interested in this section which were overall more negative than in the national survey. So, for example, in the national survey, only 43% stated that they couldn't speak to their manager about changes at work. 66% or thereabouts of PWPs saying that they don't feel they can speak to their manager about changes at work. I think particularly, you know, Duncan said really powerfully this morning, don't be silenced, but it suggests that PWPs always already feel that they are silenced only a third feeling involved in decisions which affect them in their area of work, less than a, a third involved in decisions directly affecting the public, even though they're working with members of the public every day, um, and yet only a third have sufficient opportunities to ask managers about changes. Um, does suggest a lack of PWP involvement in, for example, service design and delivery decisions, despite the huge volume of work that they are doing in services. The final point, less than a quarter were satisfied with the career opportunities available to them, I find really interesting. It might not be a surprise, given the high turnover we know there is in the PWP workforce, but less than a quarter in the national survey, that answer was around 47%. It suggests that there is a real big difference in the PWP workforce, but it also suggests that they don't see HIT training and clinical psychology training as a career opportunity as a PWP. It's something that they do because they haven't got a career opportunity as a PWP. So again, I think it's something that's really worth us exploring when we consider the well-being and retention of the PWP workforce. Um, we asked an additional question about if people felt they had the skills to do the job. Um, it was NHS England actually asked us to include that. Um, so two-thirds of respondents felt they had the right skills to work with the patients on their caseload, which means one-third didn't. And as I said before, in terms of training, some of these comments do support that. So not having supervision that meets IAP requirements, working with increasingly complex caseloads, including through service models where everyone has to go through step two first, working with PTSD and severe OCD with no additional training, often encouraged to work with complex clients who will not benefit from step two to meet performance and target requirements. There were also a small number of people who were expressing concerns about a shift to only being asked to undertake assessments as PWPs and feeling that there was a lack of respect and understanding of the PWP role. So just some of the key words really that came out in the comments section. 
Um, and I just want to read you a few key quotes that really reflected a large amount of the feedback re we receive. So, IAPT is taking its workers to breaking point. It is a national scandal for a mental health service to treat its workers this way. The service suffers hugely as a result and good workers are leaving. Concern that we are now being expected to see more cases that have previously been seen at step three or above without any extra training. Things could be done different, but that would require an entire overhaul of how the current system is, which won't happen. The PWP job is extremely stressful and it seems that everybody does it for a period, then has to move on to something else. We did get some responses of more positive good practice though, um, with one PWP saying, all IAPT staff should have a proper focus on well-being like we do. I have been a PWP for four years and have no desire to stop anytime soon. So it's nice to know there is some good practice out there as well. So you might be thinking this possibly sounds a bit less like transformation, but this is very much just the first stage. Um, it's really useful to understand these problems and understand specifically what's going on for the PWP workforce, but ideally we want some solutions to address this. So the next step of this work is a World Cafe event, which we're having in December, to begin to hopefully develop some really clear recommendations and actions to try and address the issues at an early stage. Given what a PWP asked in the room this morning about how do we give PWPs permission to do that other really valuable or even essential work that currently is hidden because of working to targets. Joe talked this morning about the need for space, the need to be supported to innovate and to have our own attachment needs met in order to meet the five year forward view. So what does that mean for PWPs who clearly have very little space right now? Thank you.